In this lesson, I'm going to discuss how to set preferences. And I've set up a project for you to use to follow along. It's just an empty project. But keep in mind that if you do follow along and make changes to your preferences, then those changes will stick. Even when you open up projects that I've created, your preferences override whatever I've done inside the projects that I've worked on. Your preferences are program-based, not project-based. And if you make changes, then decide later you want to change to something else. It's perfectly all right to do that. It's very easy to do. So let's open up Premiere Pro by just double-clicking on the icon. Click on Open Project and open up 0303 Preferences. You're inside the Working Files Projects folder. We just have this blank slate here. There's nothing inside here. Although I will bring some media in here to give you some examples about how things work. You don't have to do that. Preferences are found inside the Edit Preferences menu on Windows, and on Mac, it's Premiere Pro Preferences. And you've got all these various sort of subheadings for preferences. It doesn't make any difference which one you click on. It opens up the same Preferences dialog box. We're going to work our way through here and look at a few of the options inside here, not all of them. Go to General, talking about Video Transition Default Duration. That says how long each transition will be when you add it to a project, and that's 30 frames, which is one second in NTSC and a little bit longer than one second in PAL. Audio duration, a second. Still image duration, 150 frames. That's five seconds. All those things are fine. The timeline playback auto scrolling is just a little odd for me. I don't like page scroll. Let me show you what page scroll looks like. I'm going to go get a bunch of clips here. Let me just go on down to working files, digital juice, and grab a few clips here. I'll show you how to import clips in upcoming lessons. We'll just do it this way for now. I'll make a new sequence. Here we have these five clips in the sequence. I'm going to expand the view a little bit so that they sort of run off the side of the page. Let me turn off the audio there. Let's just see what happens when the current time indicator gets to the end. Watch what happens when you see Scenic 3 here. It's going to go along, gets toward the end, and then suddenly, boom, it jumps to Scenic 4 and Scenic 5. And that to me is disconcerting, that sort of page scroll thing is not my favorite thing. I'd rather just didn't scroll at all. So I'm going to go back here to Edit Preferences. And instead of page scroll, I would choose something like no scroll. Smooth scroll is something you might like. I'm going to put it over here and show you what smooth scroll looks like. As it goes along, the clips sort of slide under the current time indicator, which to me is disconcerting because things are happening here and things are happening down here. I'd rather just have it not scroll at all. That would be my preference. Go back to Preferences, General. So I would choose no scroll. The thing is, I want my preferences to match yours, or at least match the default setting. So at some point here, I'm going to switch back to the default setting. Timeline mouse scrolling. What happens here is I take my mouse scroll wheel and go up or down. It scrolls the timeline left and right, which is what I like. But I can change it to have it scroll vertically such that it does this. It'll scroll up and down here, depending on if I put my cursor down here or up here. I'd rather it not do that. I'd rather it scroll left and right, which is the default setting. So that's fine. I'll keep that the way it is. Back to the preferences again. These other things we'll skip, but bins, this is kind of interesting. With bins, when you double click a bin, it opens in a new window. So what does that mean? Right now we have no bins. We make a bin here by clicking this guy. I'll call this clips. There you go. And I'll put everything inside there, just so that you can see what this looks like. Put those all inside there. And I'm gonna talk about media management in an upcoming lesson, so I'll explain how this all works here. But there's this little bin with everything inside it. Now, if I double click this, what's going to happen? It opens up here in this new window, which is really not what I want to have happen. It's not my preference, but that's the default preference. I can override that by using a keyboard modifier. If I hold on the control key in Windows or the command key in Mac and double click, it opens up here in place, which is what I prefer. And if I want to get back up a level to the bin level, I can click this little guy to go back and see the bin there again like that. I want to see the icon view. I can double click on that. Double click opens up that guy, or I control double click and it opens up here in place. Hold down the Alt or the Option key, Alt and Windows Option and Mac, and double click. Opens up as a separate tab. Watch what happens. It says Project here. If I double click, suddenly it says Bin. It created a whole new tab just for that bin. Back here in the project, you can see it still exists, but now it has its own little bin. And that to me is a little disconcerting. I don't like that. So the default preference for me would be to double click and have it open in place, but that is not the default setting. So I'll just have to use my keyboard modifier to do that by leaning on the control or the command key to have it open up in place for me. But you can change it to whatever you like. Let's move on down the list here to appearance. This just says how dark or light your workspace is. You can make it really dark, really light, or set the default settings. 
So on the audio side of things, the one thing I'm interested here is this default audio tracks. It doesn't really explain what's going on here, but what it is going on here is that if you bring in, let's say, a stereo clip, when you bring it in, you can switch that stereo clip to two monaural clips if you want. So I'm going to change this thing to mono. And then I'm going to go bring in a clip here. Let me just scroll on down here to an empty space. Let me go over here to this view. And let me import in a clip that's got stereo in it, like this one here. And nothing happens, right? It doesn't look like anything magical happened. But let me show you what happens when I drag this onto the timeline. Try to get rid of the timeline here. Look at that. Two audio tracks now. This one is the left track. The one on top is left. And the one on the bottom is right. You can see that by opening up a little bit. It says L here. Let me just scroll down a little bit so you get a better view of that. There's a little L right there. If I scroll down this one a little bit more, you'll see that it says R right there. So it took the stereo track and split it up into two monaural tracks, which can be awfully convenient if you use two microphones and have those microphones go to one stereo track, and you really only want one of those microphones, that one is the principal mic. So that's a kind of a cool thing. Just be aware that you can do that on a preference base, so you might want to switch back and forth depending on the assets that you're bringing in. Go back to preferences again. Under audio, we're done with that one. I'm going to switch this guy back to use file. Audio hardware just says, you know, what audio hardware is playing back your audio. In Windows, it'll look like that, depending on the kind of hardware you've got. Mac looks a little different, but you choose whichever audio works best. For me, Creative ASI would be the best choice here, but I'm going with the default setting here again, just for some compatibility issues with folks watching this tutorial. Output mapping says, you know, where is the audio going? In this case, to my two speakers. Autosave says, do you want to automatically save projects? The default is yes, and I certainly do. It saves every 20 minutes. I can change that. And it says you can have no more than five saved versions. You can change that as well. Capture talks about video capture. The one little thing that's unchecked is a good thing to be unchecked. You don't really want to abort to capture if it's just one dropped frame. But you do want to know about it. So at least it reports it. That's good to keep that. Device control is about video capture. It just says which device is hooked up. And this changes automatically when you hook up a camcorder to your computer. Label colors and defaults. Let's go to defaults first. This says the names of the colors associated with the labels over here in the project panel. We've got that kind of blue for the clip and that kind of green thing for the sequence. Over here, you notice it says sequence is, well, my gosh, it's forest, not green. Well, who, who knew? Down here for the clip, it says movie is iris. Okay, who knew that was iris? But at any rate, that's how that works. I can change the names here by just typing in a new name, and I can change the color simply by changing the color here and really customize the heck out of my project panel. Media, the one thing in media that I'm interested in is this write XMP ID to files on import. XMP sidecar files, as they're called, are pretty important if you want to track metadata with your clips. And people don't usually do that that much, but this is the coming thing. You do want to track metadata if you've got like locations where you shot it, or you got some scripting information, or actors and that kind of stuff that you want to connect to each clip. And so when you bring in your clip, you'll automatically create an XMP file that allows you to put that kind of metadata in that XMP file. But they can also just clog up your hard drive with these little files. And so I uncheck that unless I really want to have XMP files associated with the files that I bring in. And that's unchecked by default. Memory says how you allocate memory. I've got seven out of my 12 allocated for Premiere. That's the default setting. I've got five reserved for other programs that run in the background. And I've optimized for performance, meaning I want things to go smoothly here in the timeline. But if I have really big files here, it actually might exceed the memory available to it. In that case, I would switch over to memory like this, and it should run more smoothly. And then if I use smaller files, I'd switch back to performance. But I'll just accept the default settings here. Playback is if I connect a separate monitor as opposed to just the computer monitor. Titler talks about these little swatches that you see inside the Titler. There's a style swatch and a font browser swatch. Let me just show you what they're talking about here. I'll go to Title, New Title, Default Still. I'll click this guy here, and here's the style swatch down there. And over here is a little font example. And here it's got two letters. Here you've got six. And you can decide which letters will be there. Not a big deal, but at least you have the option of changing those if you care to change them. And finally, Trim has a couple of things. The large trim offset is what you see inside the trim panel. If I put my current time indicator here near an edit point and press the T key, it automatically opens up the trim panel here. And this little button here, negative 5 and positive 5, is what you can set. If you click on this, it'll then shift over 5 frames at a time, or over here, 
minus five frames at a time, depending on which side is selected. And I can change that button to some other number is all that is. If I go back here to preferences, I can change it from five to something else. If I change it to 30, for example, then every time I click on that little button, it trims off 30 frames at a time here, boom, which is one second, by the way. One second at a time here in NTSC, that's a pretty big chunk to trim away. Just so you know what that button means, here that's one frame at a time, that you can't change. And then finally here inside preferences in the trim section, there's this option to allow selection tool to choose roll and ripple trims without modifier key, which is a long sentence for a simple thing. When you hover your cursor here over an edit point, you get this little trim tool. As long as you're not hovering over the yellow line there, you get this little trim tool. And if you use that, when you trim, it leaves a gap like that. And most folks, when they edit, they don't want to leave a gap. They want to use what's called a ripple edit tool. Let me undo that. So instead of the red tool, the trim tool, you want to have the yellow ripple edit tool. And to get that little yellow tool to show up, you hold down a keyboard modifier, Control and Windows, Command and Mac, and it turns yellow. Now, when you click, you have a ripple edit tool, which means that you're going to fill the gap by sliding things over to fill it in. Here it's red. Hold down the Control or the Command key, make it yellow, pull it in. Same thing over there, pull it in. Well, rather than holding down the keyboard modifier, I'd rather have it done automatically. And so if I change this guy to click on that little thing there and click OK, now when I hover near an edit point, it's yellow automatically. It'll automatically be the ripple edit tool. Now if I hover right on an edit point, it'll turn into a rolling edit tool where it adjusts both clips at once, which is really the more common way to do video editing with the rolling edit tool and the ripple edit tool as opposed to the trim tool. If I want to go back to the trim tool, I hold on the keyboard modifier here and it turns red and I can then trim and leave a gap. But again, I'm going to go with the default settings here and make sure that we're all on the same page. So that's all the preferences. Let me show you one little thing. If you change the preferences, you can always change them to something else later. But if you change them so much that you just go, wow, I want to start from the very beginning and then that way I can sort of start from square one, let me just show you how that works. I'm going to close down this project, say, nope, I don't want to save anything here. And the next time I start up Premiere Pro, I want it to clean out the preferences and go back to the default settings. And to do that, I hold down the Alt key in Windows or the Option key in Mac after I've double clicked on the icon. So I double click, hold on the Alt key, wait for the uh, splash screen and the dialog box to pop up and then let go of the key. Everything's cleared out here. Open up a project. Let's say we'll go back to what we just worked on here. Go back to projects, number three here. And if I go back to preferences, you'll see that that thing that I changed at the end with the trim has been switched back to the default settings. And that's how you go back to the default settings. So that, folks, is a run-through of a pretty good selection of all the preferences here inside Premiere Pro.